I don't know how to handle it. Our tears are pretty bad. Oh, yeah. I said the frontier is like 1.5 download, and this is 47 with the hot spot. With the phone. So with the phone, really, you're 1.5 on, on your phone? On the home land. My internet at home. When was the last time they updated it? Um, I think it was last year. Last year? Yeah. Last year. Seriously, we had them come in and rewire, and we went from 1 to 5. Like, whatever it was. They said the max I can get is three. Yeah. And it depends how many people are on in the community, not just in the house, in the community. Well, they did all this, but it, it didn't really change. No. The wire was pretty. Yeah. It's uh, it's six o'clock. We'll go ahead and uh, get started. We got a few. Things. We have a few things on our agenda. Thank you, Jill, for the reminder to make sure I turn my mic on. I didn't hear it, I just saw the glare. So I know we have a number of things on the agenda. Over to you. Over to me. Uh, good evening, everyone. I don't know if Jeannie Kasner, our public health director, has joined us yet in the Zoom room. I know she indicated she was going to be a little late tonight. She's got some back to back meetings going on. It is just six o'clock. It is. And she must. Okay, so she's not in. Okay. Um, uh, so with that said, if we go to item number two, just want to give you an elementary in-person update. Um, Dr. Tahal is with us tonight, and Mr. Deacon is with us tonight. Hi folks, how are you? Good, how are you? Good, good. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so uh, Brian and I wanted to share with you our process after last Monday in exploring um, all possibilities for filling the staffing needs at the elementary school in order to bring students back so that they would be uh, socially distanced um, using the six feet. So the first thing we did as the board directed was explore the possibility of using our UA teachers as elementary classroom teachers. And we, we, we did come to the conclusion that this was not a feasible solution and it's not feasible for the following reason. Number one, the majority of our UA staff is not elementary certified. They're certified in their specific area of unified arts, LBEB, music education, art education, for example. So that would mean that we would have to emergency certify those unified arts teachers in order for them to become elementary classroom teachers. Because our elementary school, as are our PLC and our intermediate school, is a school-wide Title I school, that also means that we are required by federal programs to notify the parents of the students in that, those classrooms that they are being instructed by a teacher who is not highly qualified based on the definition of highly qualified by PDE, which is a teacher who is certified in the subject area in which they are teaching. So, and then finally, so we, were, we wanted to avoid that if at all possible. Um, finally, um, we also recognized that, that there was a Huge, there would be a huge professional development need for our unified arts teachers in math instruction and reading instruction. In grades three and four, you know, those are those are critical years because as students get older, the gaps get wider. We want to be able to close as many gaps in the elementary grades as possible, especially those lower elementary grades. Um, the, the final reason is a very logistical reason for, for why we did not believe that this was a viable option, and that's because um, the UA teachers, our UAs, are used also not only to provide students with unified arts instruction, but to also provide our teachers their contracted planning time. So that would mean if we were using the UA teachers in the classroom, we would have no place for students to go when we gave our teachers their contracted planning time. So. 
for those reasons, we really um, came to the conclusion that this was not at all a viable option or one that would be in the best interest of students. If I can add one um, as well, we're really concerned because it would mean our students in grades K to two would get that unified arts experience, mm -hmm. but then our students in three through six would not. And uh, I mean, that really concerned us as well. So right. in addition to all the reasons that Dr. Chow just put out there, that was one that we looked at as well, that, that our students in grades three to six wouldn't necessarily get that enrichment experience that our students in K to two would. And then we come in that way, she So I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Deacon now, who is going to, um, take you on the rest of the journey and let you know where we are currently in terms of staffing those positions. Good evening, everyone. So, uh, last Tuesday, the elementary long term suppositions for third and grade were posted, and uh, we've had up to this point um, seven people apply. So, two of the, the candidates are. Uh, one is currently a long-term sub in the intermediate school, certified in special ed and elementary ed. Crystal Lisa and I interviewed her, her over the summer when we were anticipating potential openings. So um, I, I would certainly offer a position for her. Uh, also, uh, another candidate that was a long-term sub for us last year, uh, again, has done work for us and, and I'm confident in her ability, so that would be two. I interviewed a, another candidate on Friday and another one today. I have three more scheduled for tomorrow. So it looks like it is feasible that we, we could um, hire the, the necessary uh, qualified, certified staff to, to fill those, those six positions um, as long as the board allows us, allows us to do that. Uh, and I, I, I think you're aware of this, but one of our classrooms would be, would be in the cafeteria, the adult class of 20, it would be about 24 students, and then another class in the library of about 24 as well. So, um, again, that, that brings the number down from eight to six that it would need to hire. So it looks like we're potentially in good shape for that. Any questions? I think I've got a quick question that I think I've kind of been hearing. So K through six, if a parent chooses not to come back in person, they obviously have the virtual option with two to three teachers per classroom. What will happen if a student gets sick for, let's say, two to three days, or let's say has a quarantine? Do they then go to the virtual classroom? Or what, what happens in those situations? That's, that's the scenario that we talked about, that if a child had to be out for an extended period of time, and, and that was a child in, in person scenario, that we would, we would, it wouldn't be the same teacher, but we would slide that child into one of the, the remote teacher's classes for that period of time of a week or two, so they're not, falling behind necessarily, and, and there's not a need to necessarily catch them up when they come back. So that's that's the best solution we, we've come up with this year. Thank you. And, and then the other question is, um, if a teacher in person is not there, is absent, how oh, is that, I guess a sub would come in, and then if the virtual, the same thing for virtual? Well, if we're remote, we would probably continue the practice that we're, where we're using now, where the remote teacher is planning for emergency sub plans, so there would be asynchronous activities for the remote students to engage in that day. We, uh, ironically, Brian and I and, and Dr. Haller, we just uh, had a conversation. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> we just had a conversation about that. So obviously we would we would attempt to get a substitute for in-person teachers who are out. Um, we also know that that could potentially be a challenge. So we are going to have to make sure that we have uh, backup plans for that. At this point in time, that's on on the table for discussion tomorrow when we meet. Um, there there is potential that we could you know take other non-classroom personnel. And then have them fill in in an emergency situation when we cannot find a sub, because our, our sub list honestly is, is is short. And in a, you know previous years we'd be able to combine or split classes and send a few kids from one class here here here, but with our current rules that we need to follow with social distancing, that's not going to be an option this year either. So again, trying to think of other solutions that that would work. So. 
tonight is the you know, junior senior high school hybrid um, plan um, and coming up with this um, option hybrid learning option in person um, we vetted and went through many different scenarios um, many different scheduling scenarios many different bell scheduling scenarios um, try to come up with one that best fit our um, needs there you go next slide Again, so why hybrid? Um, again, this allows us to bring back the junior, senior, high school students in person learning. It also, this allows us to ensure social distancing guidelines in the classroom. One of the big issues we run into um, having the largest student population is the lack of ability, everybody here all the time, yeah, to social distance six feet in the classroom, given our class sizes, the uniqueness of the master schedule, and also the size of a lot of the classrooms. What, what we learned was going around with our tape measures and measuring our classrooms was all the different sizes of all the different classrooms um, throughout the building is not really one consistent standard size in, in the classroom. So this scenario we feel best resolves any issues we have with the current master schedule. Um, the, the, the drop block we're on now would not work uh, for the hybrid schedule just because kids would miss classes and may not see a teacher for over a week on their current schedule. So, so what we're going to do, what we're going to propose to you is we're going to operate on a modified block early dismissal schedule. Go ahead and pull that up. So, what we propose is again our normal arrival time. Um, we would start the day in an advisory period, and the thought behind that is, is every day the students would come in um, and have that 10-minute advisory period in the morning, and that would be a way for those students to make connections with an adult in the building. Um, we would have talking points um, for the staff, um, and just a way for a kid to feel connected and, and have an adult that they can build a relationship with to start off their day. It would go into um, four periods. So we'd be operating on a 79 minute block schedule. Middle of the day, um, we would have what we call a snack and mask break. Students were required at all times to wear the mask throughout the day. Um, we felt though um, that at some point there needs to be some type of break and hopefully we'll, we can get an answer from Ms. Kastner tonight um, when she attends as far as what, what guidelines we would need to follow um, for that mask break. Students would then be dismissed the buses at 137. 137 to 207 would be our teacher duty free lunch, which we're obligated to, to give them. And 207 to 250 would be the teacher plan. So, Joe, you want to scroll down? If you notice, there's no lunch, there's no lunches, no lunch periods in that schedule. One of the biggest issues in all the scenarios that we had to solve for was space in the cafeteria. We just couldn't come up with a way to socially distance in our cafeteria for the number of students that would need to be in there during a period of time. So for example, if you would go up and measure out six feet at the current tables or in a senior high cafeteria, you could fit 47 kids in that cafeteria at six feet socially distance, facing one direction, which is one of the requirements. The junior high cafeteria is 35 kids. And just to kind of give you a reference, on a normal day in the junior high cafeteria, we would run three lunches. Each of those lunches would be approximately 100 students on a normal scheduled day. So that was a huge issue we had to solve for. So initially when we created a schedule, at that 137 to 157, we had a grab and go. So we were gonna provide the students a grab and go lunch as they left the building. 
take with them um, for the day. We taught uh, Lisa McNamara um, took the lead and met with Linda Neff um, Food Service, um, and she stated that the plan is to provide each student's family with their lunches on a Friday, food on a Friday for that whole next previous week. So that took out the need for us to provide that, give that extra grab and go to them. They would have that food for them um, for that next pre previous, the previous week. This schedule had no impact on TCHS students. As you'll see, um, as we get into when I start talking about the blue and red groups and the actual breakdown of the days, um, it matches up perfectly with our TCHS schedule and students. We ensured that the planning period um, for the teachers um, there's actually going to be some additional planning in there each day for, for the staff. And being on this block, you know, the, we limit the number of transitions during the day. And transitions, transitions are where you're going to have the most exposure. So by limiting those transitions throughout the day, um, we have exposure to fewer individuals. Some of the issues we had to resolve were spaces in the classroom, cafeteria, and study halls. We do have some classes um, that no matter what, we did, um, we are gonna have to move classrooms, move some of the junior, senior high classrooms that are in smaller classrooms to larger junior high classrooms. It was just inevitable. We have long study halls. Um, you're in a study hall with 79 minutes with 40 something students. Um, you're, you're going to, um, you know, we're trying to avoid management issues. So students at that time can work on asynchronous activities they missed or work they need to catch up on. We realize that some student athletes do not have ways home um, and back to school on those since it's an early dismissal 137. We arranged that we would have um, supervision for those student athletes who needed to remain on campus due to event or practices. And we just felt that this was the best instructional model to fit the schedule and fit our needs. And it also meshed up with our CTE schedule. Let me slide down a little bit. Down. And then again, we have to ask um, Jeannie what the guidelines are for the snack and mask break. So, how we're going to break it down is we're going to break the students up into blue and red groups. It is not an A through L, M through Z perfect split. Um, we have rationale and reasons behind that. Um, but with the A to L, M through Z split, it caused some issues with a number of classes that were unbalanced on the two days. You can have a class of 10 or 11, and you may have 10 on one day and one on the next. Or you're going to have a class of 28, and you may have 21 day, eight on the next based on that split. So we went through and we did some um, data collection and moving around, we broke it down where we think we have a pretty good um, split. And so we broke them up into blue groups and red groups. So on blue groups, we'll attend Monday, day A, and they'll do periods one, three, five, and seven. And red groups will remain at home and have asynchronous activity. On Tuesday, the red group would come in. They would have synchronous instruction in, in person. The blue groups would do asynchronous. Wednesday, blue groups would come back in and do periods two, four, six, and eight. Red group be at home. Thursday, um, the red group would come in and do two, four, six, and eight as the blue group remained at home. And then Friday, we um, decided to make Friday a remote learning day, but make it synchronous. So there would be synchronous instruction, kind of what they're doing now um, on Friday. So you can pull that schedule up. And what we decided was it was important on that Friday for the students to see all their classes. Um, throughout the day. Now they're going to be at home. We give them a lunch break for 1145. But this way students are going to see their teachers at least twice um, during the week. Turn back to the slides. Get on the next one. So what's next for us? Um, again, we're continuing to solve some of the space issues in the classroom. So on our um, plans coming up for this week is we are going to continue to go around to the classrooms and make sure um, that we can, we have the, now we have the equal numbers, we have the numbers um, listed out in the classrooms, we'll be able to make sure that okay, this works at 60 or 14 desks in this classroom, 
we can check that off the list. And then we'll know, we'll have a better idea of the number of classrooms we need to move. We do have some open classrooms that are larger, so we think we're able to move some around to avoid that issue. What back to school nights look like, um, an issue where, and again, it'll be good to hear from um, Ms. Kasner tonight, um, because the, the 250 and 25, what does it look like for us inside to hold a large group back to school night? Is that even feasible? We were throwing around today um, before this meeting of, cre of creating videos for the family of what our expectations are, how to wear your mask, how not to congregate in the hallway, what our expectations are, and having that out for the families as the back to school night. Communicating to groups of junior high and senior high school families. We have a spreadsheet created for Melmers. We are going to have it ready to go out to the families um, to notify them whether in the blue and red group with a letter that explaining everything. Week of October 12th, our transition back to learning. So we're beginning to plan for that week back where it's not going to be traditional. Everybody comes on that first day and we get the ground running. We're looking at um, the possibility of seventh and ninth grade blue group being here on Monday, seventh and ninth grade red group being here on on um, Tuesday, because those students have seventh grade has a transition into the junior high school from the intermediate school. And although it's in the same building, you'd be amazed how many ninth graders have never really made it over to the senior high. So having that transition as a ninth grader um, into the senior high school. And then planting and phasing it in from there and having your students back on Wednesday and Thursday. Ongoing professional development is needed for teaching in the hybrid model and the block and also planning for our advisory period. So what about the students that want to be virtual? Would they, would the OBA their only choice? OBA would be their only choice. So it was, so they needed to have made that decision already, not unlike the K through six. Not yet, no, they were, no, October 5th. So okay. if we have um, parents at this point who take a look at the hybrid scenario we created and they still say, you know what, um, we want that remote, that virtual experience, we are willing to open the Octorera Virtual Academy up to them. And actually in a communication that will go out from me um, tomorrow, that will be something that I will explain. Okay, so it's not going to be like K through six where we do have some of our own software teachers doing virtual. It's Correct. one or the other. There yeah. is no. It's in, it's impossible. Seven through twelve. We always talk about, you know, is there a unicorn out there who is certified in everything that a student seven through twelve would take? You know, um, you know that that amazing person who is certified in every level of math every level of science and every level of ELA, everything that a junior, senior, high school student would take, that's one of the challenges that we have. You know, K to six is in that self-contained classroom world, right? The master schedule in a junior, senior, high school is very unique because you have content certified staff. Well, for example, what if you have, again, the question that I asked for K through six, which is the same question, if you have a student that is absent for three days or let's say needs to quarantine, I don't. and they be able to log into that synchronous class and participate, or how, how would that work? Again, I'm, not, you know, I'm asking if you have one teacher that has 10, whatever the amount of students, would there be an option for someone to actually attend that via Zoom or something else? How would you handle it? We haven't talked about that yet, but what happens if we have a junior, senior high student who finds themselves in a quarantine scenario and they need access to their classes? So I, I will tell you we haven't talked about that type of scenario yet. So that's as well. And also just sickness, you know, if yes. you're out for three days, you know, how, how would that happen? Because I think that's been a concern of people like can I just log on. Right. Um, and then for the students that are currently in hybrid, you know, we have students that have OBA classes and they have popular virtual. Do they then need to make a choice or can they keep that? Well, they would have to make a choice either to come back to the in person hybrid or state OBA. Are, are we certain of that? Because I thought my conversations with Mark Patika, we do have a number of um, students. So you mean come back to the building? Like, okay, yes. Yeah, yes, that yes, they, yes. they would maintain whatever classes they were taking in the Octorera Virtual Academy and then they would come back in the hybrid model face to face with whatever they wanted to take here. So. And, and are there options for students, let's say, that have that type of schedule? 
that the point exists, we might only be there one period. Yes. Might only, will they be able to come and go so that we can eliminate yes. bodies that don't need to be there? And we've discussed and we're, we're continuing looking at like seniors and juniors who may have that time of the day where they don't have to be here every single period, um, and particularly seniors. Uh, when they don't have to be here, they can leave the building, and that does cut down on the number of students in the building at one time. And then the, the last two questions is, um, unless you want to get a different number of questions. No, 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 no. Uh, my, my last, my, one, my last question is again the same thing with, with absenteeism and with staff. Um, on those asynchronous days, they have lessons planned, and on the synchronous days, which is really a subject. And I, I asked that specifically, and again, I'm not asking for this answer, but I've heard anecdotally that maybe parents are just finding out this, but they're going in and they're finding they're, they're, they're you know. In the morning, there's six teachers that are absent. So I don't think we have a higher degree of absenteeism right now. Um, I've just heard some, again, parents say, wow, well, like this, this teacher's absent, this teacher's absent. Um, and I just didn't know how that would all fit into. Well, the synchronous in person, we would treat it like any other, any regular school day as teachers absent. We tend to get us up. Mm -hmm. um, or not, we would cover classes. Um, for if they're, you know, now that the teachers are absent, Teachers are required to have three days of asynchronous activities in case of an absence that they be posed for students to contemplate. Yeah. Just one real quick question. If the student, if we can maintain the six foot distance, do they still have to wear a mask? Yes. Yes. So it's not like and that's a that's a question we can confirm with CCHD tonight. Can I ask one quick question? Um, has there been any issues so far with kids logging in? And then I know there's been some connectivity issues, but as far as taking attendance and what about kids who come and go? Like you just mentioned how seniors or some juniors may have some opportunities to do that. Has there been an issue, maybe district wide, with attendance and, and like, controlling that? I can speak for the junior senior high schools. We've kept track, if they track upon the number of kids who have not attended or who have just shown up for some or, or kind of popped in and left. Um, we're making regular contact with those individuals. We've done home visits on those individuals. Um, you know, I know Lisa went to the house today, they weren't there, they, she, then she went to the friend's house because that's where they were at. So, you know, we're, we're keeping tabs on them. We have a, a spreadsheet where we have our color coded and how who's, who's attending, who's not attending, and, and what steps we've taken. Thank you. I, I do have one quick, quick question. Sure. The asynchronous days. So, we have students that will currently have two full asynchronous days from the schedule, correct? Correct. So, have, is that asynchronous again with that classroom teacher who has to prepare synchronous and then asynchronous activities? And have we uh, increased professional development so it's not the, um, if we don't have the challenges, put it nicely, we had in the spring. So if they lose to a secret days are legitimate. That's, okay, that's not too much. Right. right. And that's the, the again, welcome. What's next is we have to on the ongoing professional development for the staff in the hybrid model to prepare those asynchronous activities and what they may look like. Good evening. I apologize for my delay. I, I had my son at a medical uh, appointment and it just ran a little long. Welcome back. Thank um, you. We're glad to see you. I, I know I've sent you a number of questions in advance. If yeah. Let's start with those. Sure. Okay. Um, and I really thank you for taking the time. So um, as you can see, the administration has been hard at work uh, preparing for what an in-person face-to-face approach may look like. And uh, maybe we got into the weeds in some of those questions, but no, no worries. We're trying to figure out what the procedures, what the protocols look like, especially K to six. You know, if you read some of those, you were probably thinking, wow, that sounds like a question 
in a K to six school. So we uh, very much appreciate your help tonight. Uh, you're welcome. I applaud you for all that uh, you and the board and your uh, executive staff are doing. So I'll go through these and certainly if it's not clear or if it generates additional questions, uh, that would be fine. I can certainly handle those. And if it's something I perhaps cannot answer, I can certainly get back with, <clears throat> with you uh, in writing. So I'm going to just start with the uh, first um, document that was shared with me and I'll read the question then provide the answer. Uh, if student staff are wearing face shields, do they also need to wear a mask? So first and foremost, a mask is preferred over a face shield. If for some reason a mask cannot be worn, and there's a couple different scenarios for that, uh, either physical inability um, or if someone, if someone needs to read lips and we don't have a clear um, mask, then certainly a face shield uh, would support. Uh, the combination of the two are good, but if there is an incidence where a face shield is the only thing uh, that is available or warranted in that particular scenario, a face shield is fine. Uh, we just need to make sure the face shield is worn properly. Uh, I see a lot of face shields that kind of, they're tilted up. You want to make sure the face shield is uh, vertical with the face and not kind of poking out at the chin level. Uh, all right, next question. In our K-6 to schools, should our special area teachers, music, art, health, etc., go to the regular classroom education classrooms to teach, or can students go to the special area classrooms for class? Is, if yes, what should be done in between classes? So this really becomes uh, your decision. I don't know your buildings as well as you do. I don't know how your students uh, you know, navigate through the school. I know one of the recommendations in the guidance was, if possible, have teachers move between classrooms, and that was to reduce the number of people having to move. If it's not possible, kids can go in those special area classrooms um, and, you know, still, you know, have the uh, full enjoyment of the lesson. So question number three, I'm gonna, until um, somebody, let me make sure I can see all of you. Um, and maybe Michelle, if I don't notice someone needing to jump in with a question, uh, help me because I do have the document up on my screen so I can uh, read it as I go. Alrighty, you'll do. Yeah, let me just adjust my screen so I can have everything up, you and the questions. There's a second part of that question. Yeah, there is a second part to there being to that question. Oh, yes. If yes, what should be done in between classes? In terms of cleaning, is that the, the essence of the second part of the question? Yes. Okay. So it's going to depend on the, you know, what class it is. So <clears throat> if it's a music class and each kid is, you know, handed a tambourine, we want to try to clean those between. Um, if it's the art class and we know kids are using the tabletop, we want to wipe down the tabletops between the classes. So just some general, not, not full on disinfection, sanitation, just a general write down um, between them. And so this is very similar to um, physical education where um, they have a lot of equipment. That equipment should be cleaned between or um, enough equipment exists where you can just, after each usage, it goes into a basket per se, and then they can um, clean it at the end of the day and recycle them uh, for the next day. Thank you. Yeah, students will be eating in the classroom. Can they take mass breaks in the classroom? Yes, they can. The key to mass breaks is to keeping them to 10 minutes or less, uh, ensuring that the activity being done during a mass break does not invite a whole lot of talking, shouting, singing. Um, I, <clears throat> I actually had a teacher share an example of using it as the time to do their independent work. So where their heads, you know, their heads are down on their worksheet or they're doing their writing, um, and the teacher has a timer on. So that way it's actually built into the lesson and it's not a 
whole another thing you have to account for in the, in the timing of the day um, within each classroom. So yes, they can take them in the classroom. Um, and like I said, usually the teacher will have a timer and kids will be told, even if the work's not done, it's time to put your mask back up. So that is definitely uh, something that can be worked in. In small groups, if there is a plexiglass shield between students and a staff, do masks need to be worn? Is that question both for the student and staff or just for the staff? I think it's for students and staff. Okay. Uh, the, so technically, yes. Um, I, I'll be honest with you. One of my concerns when we start building in, um, you know, the non, non break like taking off of masks is we run the risk of getting out of a good habit of keeping the mask on. So yes, if you can create the plexiglass barrier, uh, but there, I, I would encourage you to increase just diligence and reminders around masking because kids may forget, oops, the barrier's not there. Um, so if, if that is the route you have to go, just be cognizant, it may break down some uh, learned behaviors. All right, the next question. What procedures should be used for mass breaks at the elementary and secondary level, outside versus inside? Certainly outside is a good option. However, and maybe others have come up with a, you know, a good alternative. When I think of outside mass breaks, I'm thinking of um, recess or a activity or a classroom that's been moved outside. And we don't, we don't want to do it during recess because they're all out there playing, shouting, uh, getting close to each other um, or closer um, within that 15 minute period. So if it, regardless of where it is, the mass breaks, the fundamentals are keep it to the 10 minutes or less and try to ensure the activity is not one that invites droplets coming from an individual's mouth. All right, seven to 12 may be preparing or proposing an early dismissal with a grab and go lunch. What social distancing guidelines will need to be followed on the bus so students can eat? This is a tough one okay. because when students eat, they need their masks down. And the bus is by far the smallest space students will be in during their day. Um, amongst other people that are not a part of their household. So I'm not a huge fan of eating on the bus during our bus limitations, with the limitations we have to put on the bus. Well, um, you'll, you'll be pleased to know that we have ruled this out, right? But we, we just, we thought we'd leave the question in because we sure. were, you know, this year is going to be so unpredictable that you okay. know, we figured, well, we might as well leave it there and get an answer and hear what you had to say if we ever have to use it. If you have to come back to this mm -hmm. as an option, I would say you have to further limit one person per seat and stagger to where you have the first row or the first filled row, I should say, at the window, the next row at the aisle, then window, aisle, window, aisle, um, again, it's because the mask is down and they're doing something, an activity like eating that has a uh, uh, prime op opportunity for um, droplets coming out. All right, what should recess look like for K to six students? It has to be fun. That's all I got to say. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, can equipment and or balls be used? What about the monkey bars and slides? So. Um, I'm not, I can't tell you what it has to absolutely look like. I, again, I don't know your property, but I have heard some really good ideas around sectioning off the playground and each class gets a certain section. Um, and then there's less crossing over and less common, less crossover use of equipment, whether it's stationary equipment like the monkey bars and slides or the um, more uh, mobile equipment like your balls, jump ropes, hula hoops, et cetera. Uh, regardless of whether it's recess or not, any equipment, your laptops, your um, tech tactile um, tools within the classrooms, your 
um, balls, your scooters, those all need to be cleaned um, after each use uh, or have them assigned to a classroom and then that classroom kind of comes and goes with its own equipment is another idea I've heard. In terms of monkey bars and slides, uh, I think they're fine. I'm, I'm assuming we don't have kids, you know, hanging on one monkey bar for more than 15 minutes at a time or hanging out on a slide for more than 15 minutes at a time. Uh, to the extent possible, much like we recommend with our count, uh, community parks, you want to try to wipe down those high surface areas, um, I would say at least once a day um, for the stationary uh, equipment. All right, when a group of student leaves an area, a table, et cetera, what needs to be done to get tables ready for the next group of students to come and occupy that table? Is this like in this scenario of a cafeteria? Yes. Okay. Uh, I, would, I would lean on what you're doing now and do that general cleaning and then your after school cleaning would pick up that more, um, uh, that deeper cleaning. Of it. it does not have to be the, the spray, uh, you know, the sanitizing and the, uh, you know, the deconnect contamination type. It's your routine tabletop cleaning would be uh, appropriate for that. And that would be true of, you know, like I said, with the art room or any other shared room. Right, what about like for our junior, senior high, we're going to have classes come in and then go to another room. Right? Mm -hmm. So what about like in, in uh, a changing of a classroom during the day? So uh, that at uh, the, uh, uh, let me start over. Sorry, you catch me with a dry mouth and a train of thought. Uh, what I have heard uh, some schools doing is they actually have the, um, just the regular household wipes in the room and there's a quick wipe of the desktop. Uh, it is if, you know, again, this, there, you don't have a ton of desks in these um, rooms just so you can maintain the social distancing. So it's a, intended to be just a quick wipe on it. Um, I have even heard of stu schools having the students do it as part of their leaving routine, you know, before they exit the room. I don't know all the insurance and risks and legal side of that, but I've heard that being uh, proposed as well. So a general wiping if possible. We fully understand that the classrooms um, are may pose a challenge just due to the, the turnover in that classroom. If that becomes a challenge, I then would not, I would not stress too much about it because the assumption is the kids have access to the hand sanitizer in that classroom. The kids are wearing their masks along with the uh, teacher. Unlike if you're in a cafeteria where the mask is off and students are talking without a mask while also eating. Um, so just weigh what that looks like in your um, secondary classrooms. Uh, and if you have good compliance, then you can clean once a day those tabletops. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, library books. How long does a library book need to sit when returned from a student? If they're looking at books, can they pick them up and look at them while they decide uh, which book to pick up? You know, I, I was actually today trying to do uh, some more current um, research on things like books and uh, especially those that are not the hard um, traditional services. Uh, my understanding, and I will confirm this for you, uh, is much like the groceries we used to wipe down in our cereal boxes, etc. I don't think that is a significant contributor to how it is being spread. Um, assuming people are wearing their mask and they're not, you know, kind of wiping their face with their hands and then going after whatever object, whether it's the book, the cash register or whatnot. Um, so for a book, it's, it's, I'm going to err on the side of, we don't need to be overly concerned about sitting a book out of circulation, wiping it down after X number of days and not allowing them to actually engage with the book while looking for one. I will confirm that because I did not get enough of my research done um, on your behalf when I saw that one, that question. All right, if students are wearing masks, can they sit together at an area rug or at a round table or a horseshoe shaped table for a small group instructor? If so, this 
should this be limited to 15 minutes at a time? So if they're wearing masks and they have to be less than six feet away, yes, you want them to be 15 minutes or less. All right, in music class, if students wash hands before going to music and use hand sanitizer before picking up an instrument, can it be picked up by another student or it does it need to be cleaned? Uh, this is probably gonna be specific to the instrument. Um, I heard from a physician that there's been lots of studies on our wind instruments and how much they actually can project um, um, air, uh, droplets in the air. So I would imagine if it's anything wind related, obviously mouthpieces are a different uh, topic. We do not wanna share that. Uh, or if it is in kind of the direction of a wind uh, instrument, you do not want to reuse it um, for another student. Um, best case scenario is you're able to wipe it down even if it's just with a, a, a general household wipe that you know obviously is appropriate for corona. It doesn't have to be what our, um, our um, maintenance and facilities team would do. Uh, but if you cannot, I would make sure we are truly limiting those instruments to the ones that are only used by hands and not anywhere kind of in that face area. So if they're playing a triangle, they play it out and not up in front of their uh, face. Uh, okay. Can music class be held with students special distance but wearing, or social distance but wearing masks? So is this just normal music or are we talking like choir with singing and all? I'm not sure it's normal. It's, normal. it's just like a general music class? Yeah, I would say they could as long as the social distancing, they're wearing masks. Yeah, I would. I think it's feasible. In case of inclement weather, can phys ed class be held in the gym? Regardless of the location, can students use equipment during phys ed? If so, what needs to be done after each? So this is similar to what we've talked about before. Um, there's nothing that says gym currently can't be held in the, uh, I'm sorry, phys ed can currently be held in the gym. It's best to keep it outside while you can until hopefully we get into, um, you know, into the, the cooler season. Uh, if you have to have it in, you're, you will have to get creative with your class because uh, you don't want all the kids in a small area for more than 15 minutes, particularly or one idea to consider is breaking them up into cohorts throughout the room um, or leveraging the cafeteria if that's not already part of your um, gym. Uh, so again, we do want to clean as much equipment as we can. Uh, but again, let's say we're, we're doing pull-ups on a chin bar. Um, if the kids have access to hand sanitizer before and after that, there's less concern about cleaning it after each person. So again, I don't know how much you have in place for the other measures, but all we're doing is constantly layering more on. And the more layers you have, the more, obviously the more protection, but the more option to say, if I can't actually wipe down that bar, what are my other measures in place that will help mitigate it? It is the hand sanitizer. So that's kind of how you need to think of these without knowing all of your details um, on your supplies and where they're stationed throughout the school. <clears throat> all right, what is the expectation for cleaning on surfaces in classrooms between class periods? I believe we've covered that. Uh, everybody satisfied with that previous or at least understand it? I think we're good. I'm taking a look at the team out there in the peanut gallery to see and I'm getting the thumbs up, so. Okay, great. Cleaning and hand sanitizing are the two big takeaways there. Yes. Yep. Okay. Uh, do students need to wear masks at outdoor recess? According to the revised mask, or I'm sorry, face covering order, yes, they do. What are C CCHD's guidelines on crowd limit? Should we continue with the 15 indoor, 250 outdoor? <clears throat> While struck down, is it still the guidance we should follow or should we follow a percent capacity 
of space model in combination with maintaining a minimum of six feet of separation and wearing masks. So um, the, is this for in, instruction days? Is this question relevant to instruction days or like a Girl Scout group coming I, I into the school? I, I think it could, could go to both, Katie, because you know one of the questions that came up tonight um, as we bring our kids back, the opportunity to bring our, um, to have the back to school nights, the way we used to have the back to school nights where folks came in. Yep. And, and so even though that question is generally related to sports right now, you know, we are having those conversations about bringing in small groups, um, especially as it relates to a back to school night. Great, thank you for that clarification. So here, here's the health department's uh, position on number of uh, individuals in a group gathering. Um, the, the important thing with COVID is the fact that it's a group. We have, we have evidence through our investigation that groups of small size, middle and big, have, in, have incurred transmission. So it's not the number, it's what you're doing and what prevention measures you have in place. So I'm, I am convinced that you can have folks come in in groups with all the other measures that you are used to and already planning for, for your students to receive an in-class uh, education and apply that to a back to school night, a conference night, et cetera. There's no magic number in my mind because we've seen it in small, medium, and large groups. Um, and that's really where we're trying to focus. It's, you know, do you want everybody, you know, do you want a group of 25 people coming in and singing without masks, you know, at a choir? No. But can you have a group of 50 people come in and do, you know, parent teacher conferences with some, you know, requirements of masking and someone at the door ha having hand sanitizer available and all the other measures? You can do it. I'm sure you can. All right. Uh, the next one, CHOP doctors suggested no close contact sports such as football and wrestling. Does CCHD have guidance on specific sports? We do not have guidance on specific sports. Uh, and frankly, that's uh, for a couple reasons. Um, and I am, this is my entry into, uh, you know, primary and secondary uh, sports. And I am learning uh, the world of PIAA and all the other facets of our uh, sports through our school system. And my ultimate hope was that the PIAA would weigh in on this and then we would in terms of which sports and then we would kind of apply um, the methods for making those sports uh, safer um, such as the masking and the temperature checks etc cetera, etc cetera. so we do not and I do not anticipate that um, in the near future Uh, administrators are meeting with school nurses to review the flow charts and notification procedures as posted uh, on CCHD's website. Is there any new information to share with our school nurses? Uh, at this time, no. Uh, my goal is whenever those flow charts or notification procedures need to change, we instruct all of our school team uh, members to share that out with your individual schools, and then I share it with superintendents. So we're trying to come at it from both angles, from the school uh, pandemic team level and the superintendent level. If they hear it twice, that's even better. Yep. Um, so at this time, there's no new information for school nurses. All right, so that's awesome. So what is currently up on the CCHD website is what stands, those flow charts, because we are beginning to train staff <coughs> on those flow charts. Um, that, I really appreciate the uh, communication tool too, that I'm not going to have to sit there and figure out what it is I'm going to tell the school community. I really, really appreciate the format that you folks came up with because it's going to be consistent all year. So. Yeah, the, the time when those change are, for example, and we already saw this since those flowcharts were up, if we have a symptom 
that becomes a more critical symptom. Like, for example, loss of taste and smell used to be a symptom that you had to have in combination with another before we considered sending a student or anyone home for that matter. Now, if you have that just by itself, you're gonna go home. So it's more of those, um, the signs and symptoms or what, what deems somebody to be a close contact. Let's say, you know, three weeks from now, they say close contacts are greater than 30 minutes. The flow chart would change, but the, the, the basics of it are not. It's more of which ones are we going to send home versus not, who's included, who's not included. Those kinds of things are the more common things to change at this point. Uh, Jeannie, can you clarify how many cases would close a school? Like, this is the question that, that superintendents <laughs> continue to ask. Because when I look at the flow charts, those flow charts are very flexible in how we deal with certain cases as they come up. So um, when I was looking at the flow charts today, the sense I got is that quarantine would be the first thing that we would do and that we would not necessarily after a case or two have to shut a school down if we have quarantined those kids and the contact tracing has occurred and cchd has a good handle on who's been affected is that right to infer that so so let me let me and i caught most of what you said and some of it's just you know my audio um so i apologize the flow chart won't tell you when to close a, a school uh, because what we need to do is take into consideration how many investigations, how those investigations are related to each other, um, and are we seeing spread within the school. So our goal is to get investigations done so that we can tell is is case number one something that came into the school and then spread to case number two, or is case number two another case that came in from outside the school? Let's say two different families had two totally separate barbecues and they both came in. You have two cases, but they're unrelated to each other. We know where they came from and you're doing the appropriate quarantine uh, of their close contacts. So we're, we're not willing to say that it's gonna spread within the school because it's just two independent cases. Um, when we have two or more cases in a classroom or a cohort, and a cohort might be a team or, um, you know, let's say you're combining for art class two halves of two classes, for example, not that you, should be doing that, but if you can't avoid it. Um, within a 14 day period that are, we call it epidemiologically linked. They, they have a connection to each other within your school or outside the school, which explains why those two have a, are um, positive and they don't share a household and they don't share close contacts that we've researched outside the school. So that then starts to say, ah, now we have transmission within the school. So at two, depending what else is going on in the school, we're absolutely gonna say, okay, what's going on in the school? We're gonna have that conversation with your team, perhaps the nurse to say, what's going on? And it could be, you know what? We had a mass break that didn't, a mask break that did not go well. Okay, so there, that's an example of a failure in the process or in the prevention measure, which can be addressed and hopefully then mitigate the rest, or no, nothing, nothing in the process broke down. Now we're gonna be considering if we need to close that classroom. Our goal is not to jump to closing an entire building. Our goal is to look at a classroom at a time or what classrooms were impacted by those who are positive and their, their contacts. Um, so there's a bit of a framework to start from. It's not all written in stone because we do have to take the nuances of sometimes it's your physical setup. So if you're a building with wings, 
versus a single building that doesn't have, uh, you know, designated wings of uh, grade level, uh, and then also how those are, are connected, the, the cases themselves. It gets complicated, and I apologize for that. Uh, there's no way to avoid it, uh, the complicated nature of it. Uh, but we don't want to rush into just outright closing buildings at a time. Does that help? That does help. All right, so I'm moving on to the second set of questions, and some of these may uh, be similar uh, or even repeats of them. So bear with me. If I don't recognize it, you can uh, certainly point it out. Okay. What is the recommendation for classroom desks to be cleaned after students have masks off to eat, eat after lunch in the classroom? I would do the wipe down in that case. Just again, that general household COVID, you know, um, COVID compliant wipe down. Is it best practice to take kids outside somewhere to have these snack breaks? Or should staff make sure that students are all faced in one direction and not directly facing the teacher while demasking and eating? Uh, outside is good. If it can be done, that would be great. Uh, you still don't want a whole lot of people facing each other, even if outside. Granted, if they can get, you know, more than six feet apart, might be a little bit more relaxed if we're in a, like say a 12 foot circle. Um, with some spacing between each individual. Uh, and then same with um, whether they're just demasking for a break or eating, uh, just avoid that face-to-face. -face. Regarding reading activities, how can books be shared or how long do they need to sit before they are used with another group? I believe we covered that uh, and I will confirm this one for you. <clears throat> yeah, you're good there. Okay. What type of procedures and letters are recommended to notify cases? All right, this is a great question. <clears throat> so um, ideally, and you know, we, we have to start with our ideal. We know we may deviate from it. A case is going to be contacted by the health department. The health department will give that case um, what is called a, um, it's an isolation letter. So our cases isolate our contacts quarantine, just to separate the two. And it will give them instructions on it um, for what is expected, what to do if they become symptomatic or feel worse in their health, etc. So that's how the individuals are going to be notified. The school will be notified. And on our website, under the school section, there is a um, some text that we put out there for a standard letter to consider sending to the individuals who are impacted. So there's two ways we uh, typically have played this out. One is um, if we know all the contacts by which you would have given us as much as you can, we'll do all the calling and the contacts will have their information. If we can't get a hold of the contacts, we may ask you, can you send this letter to all of the students in classroom 24B, for example? Um, so that's the group that is impacted. And if you have uh, plans on notifying the school in general, then the recommendation would be go to our website, take the language off of that sample uh, communication. If you change what we wrote, we do ask you to um, have our, your school contact from the health department to review that um, because there's certain things we have to have in there um, according to how we have to communicate to uh, cases and close contacts. Uh, but you're more than welcome to wrap other information around it. And really what that letter says is, yes, there is a case. Yes, the school is you know, collaborating with the health department. Yes, they're doing everything they can. Um, and the school will remain in close contact with the um, individuals impacted and when they can come back. So it's, it's, it's our, the piece that we would send if you didn't send anything to, uh, or if we couldn't get to the individuals because we didn't have good numbers or they, they just weren't answering their phones for some reason. Um, so that's generally how that works. Our 
you know, our recommendation from the start, and this is what we learned from the spring is we don't want to have to send out alarms for every case because then we increase the worry, we increase the, um, the, the volume and, and, and then we're, we're having to field all the calls and it's, it's you fielding them as well as my department. Not that we don't want to, but we don't wanna create worried well. If we've done the investigation, we've gotten all the contacts, that is the population we are the most concerned about. Um, but we do understand schools need to communicate openly and um, faithfully with their population, and we support that. Um, just as long as we're not setting off, uh, you know, the alarms uh, without without any uh, need to do that. All right. In regard to student athletes not held to the six feet distance or wearing masks when physically interacting with each other, should they be tested, especially in cases where some could be asymptomatic, before coming into classes? This is another tough one. Um, so ideally, our practices, our conditioning, et cetera, we are really trying to do six feet and masks for at least the parts of the practice that can support masking um, and limit that physical interaction. Should they be tested, that's actually a discussion going on um, with your peers in Delaware County and some initial discussions in Chester County, testing of athletes. Um, let, me, let me comment on the parenthetical, especially in cases where some may, uh, could be asymptomatic. I don't care if you're an athlete or not, um, if you're asymptomatic, um, you need to be really conscientious of what your activities are uh, before coming into this group, in this case, uh, you know, a team of individuals. If you are not practicing good, um, you know, COVID practices outside of the team, uh, I think your coaches need to start to stress that because it's the asymptomatic ones that are those, as they call them, the silent or secret spreaders um, in those cases. So we are trying to understand, we're trying to kind of work through what does testing look like um, for athletes. I'm gonna be perfectly honest with you. I am professionally challenged by the notion of just testing athletes. I'm just, I'm gonna be very honest with you. And I believe on superintendent meetings, I've been clear about that when it has come up with it. Uh, nonetheless, we are, we are actually, we're going to do our due diligence uh, with some support from uh, others in the county to see what does that look like if it should be done. I know our collegiate level are doing it and our professional level are doing it. They sit at a very different level of sports and a very different level of resources um, in order to make that happen. All right. Uh, does the CCHD recommend that all schools offer a remote option for populations of students who still do not feel safe or have pre-existing conditions or live with vulnerable family members attending in-person school? On page 10 of CCHD guidelines, it's recommended that, quote, schools should consider remote learning for students excluded from school who are well enough to continue learning. Should this be a possibility for Octorera? students. So that was put in there to stress to schools that there will be many times that a student will be quarantined but will be well enough to continue to learn. So should not necessarily be taken of that opportunity. Again, trying to keep fair and equitable access to education. Um, nor should it be counted as, you know, absence or missed work, et cetera. It's not, I'm, I'm not trying to tell you what to do with the work and the absence. It's more of the recognition that, especially in the younger population, many of them can be either positive or a close contact and be quarantined or isolated and feel well enough to continue with their lessons, assuming the school has the resources to offer that online. I think it's a great idea if you can do it there and, and then you prevent some potential falling behind because let's admit it, 10 
and 14 days is no short time to be isolated or quarantined. Likewise, CCHD recommends on page 11, quote, ensure families who choose not to send their children to school receive remote learning opportunities aligning with I IEP guidelines. Octorera has virtual learning, but CCHD guidelines indicate that remote options for students can still be with their teacher is required, not required. These are recommendations just so we don't, and again, this was lean in consultation with Department of Education, in this case, not the Department of Health, of how can we ensure high-risk students, those with IEPs, those with um, uh, special needs, special education, do not miss an opportunity just because it is virtual. Um, so really that's what it is. These are recommendations. Uh, it does not say are required. It should, it says, um, it's more of the, you need to consider these and not penalize, um, students. And I would never consider you would, but these were guidance from the department at the Commonwealth's, uh, Department of Education to, uh, as good practices. Thanks for clarifying. Absolutely. All right, hang in there, only a few more. Uh, CCHD guidelines suggest one-way hallway traffic patterns. Have most schools implemented this successfully and how might we be able to accomplish that? So the most common way of implementing that is right hand is in one, what right hand side of the hallway is one direction, left hand's the other. It's not a big you know, cattle prod, if you will. It's lines going down the sides of the hallways. That is by far the easiest. Um, I do know some schools who can do one way entire in a, in a hallway traffic, but again, I don't know all the buildings. You'll have to assess which is easier, but the most common is splitting the hallway, if you will. Yeah, I'm not as concerned about that K to six, it's seven through 12 in a junior, senior high school, our size and and the hallways, all the hallways that connect. So, um, but I like that right and left. Yeah, some folks are literally just putting a, a, the, the blue or the green tape right down the center and then they tape arrows, you know, which way each, and depending on which way they're going to class, they're on one side of the hallway. That's probably the easiest I've heard. And that's honestly, when this was being written, that's kind of what we envisioned. But again, we don't want to put all that detail in there because your building's different than someone else's. Okay, how often throughout each day should bathrooms be clean? I'll tell you what I tell my employer. One time is fine. Um, however, if you know you have uh, bathrooms that are used by perhaps special needs or any groups that may not be as uh, cleanly, uh, certainly I would do that more than one time a day. Uh, you might in the beginning, and I've, I've, I've uh, recommended this to a couple um, schools who've gotten down to this question is, you know, see, start it with maybe twice a day and then just kind of monitor. Are, are, are your facility folks seeing that the, the, the bathrooms are just continue to be a mess? Uh, some of that's going to be gauged by how many kids you're allowing in the bathroom at a time due to space and so on and so forth. Um, and then kind of tapering back from there. Um, hopefully, hopefully you'll see signs of, uh, you know, good, good compliance and it's not as, um, as needed. But, um, you know, definitely the once a day, and that would be more of that uh, solid cleaning. Uh, um, and, and if they're not already doing like the, you know, door handles of the bathroom and all the stalls, include that if that's not a typical, uh, part of the daily cleaning of the bathrooms, the edges of the doors, you know how the kids, well, any of us can close doors by the edges and not the handle, etc. So you might have to add a few things to that uh, end of day um, or after hours cleaning um, list. Uh -huh. uh, the next one, on-site screening for symptoms and temperature is required for all non-essential visitors and volunteers. Um, is this being done at other schools and how is it being done? So, so there's a balance here because elsewhere in the guidance, it says limit, if not exclude, non-essential visitors and volunteers from the building. Right. However, if you have to let them in, 
Our recommendation is you check signs and symptoms and their temperature, not, you know, have that come from, uh, you know, their own doing it. Uh, now, I am willing to say that if, and I see the word is required here, absolutely. If for some reason this it becomes the biggest barrier for you, and again, this is just for non-essential visitors and volunteers, you can come back and talk to me and we can, you know, we can agree that this is uh, a, a different verb than required. However, what folks are typically doing, and we even do this for our non-essentials in our building, they, we have a form, and I'd be willing to share that if that's not already up on the website. It asks a few questions about signs and symptoms, and then they have a non, no touch thermometer that goes toward the forehead. If they meet that, they're allowed in, if they meet the temperature piece of it. So it's just a quick little uh, survey that's done. That is the last of the two sets of questions. Are there any others that uh, may have come up since? Well, first, uh, just for the admin team, I know you were taking a read, but uh, do you guys feel you have everything answered that you need? Get a thumbs up from the Hi, hey, Jeannie, I have a question for you regarding. Jeannie, <laughs> for the schools that are keeping that data and doing the temperature checks when people are coming in. Are they warehousing and maintaining the data or is it something that's destroyed um, you know, upon entry or exit? So I don't know the specific schools. That's the process we use in all of our county buildings. What we do is at the end of each day, we're just destroying. And because it does have some personal information, we're actually doing the shredding on it. Okay, so it's not something to be maintained or warehoused? Thank I you. would not. Thank well, I, let me take that back. Let me take that back. I, I apologize. Um, I would keep them because if they were in the building and we had an outbreak, we would want to notify them. Um, so you want to know who, if, if that is your way, don't make that your only way of uh, logging people coming in. And I know you all use, you know, probably the Raptor and other tools as well. So as long as we know that they've been in the school, should we need to contact them? Uh, but we, we trust that you guys are going to do what you need to do. So we're not going to come back and say, hey, let me see the screening form. Now, we just need to know that they had presence in the school um, in the event we need to, you know, they're a part of any contact tracing. All right, thank you. So we would keep a visitor log, but don't write the temperature down next to the visitor log. Right, that's, right. That's, that's the Other comments, questions from board members? Jerry? Yeah, I got uh, just a few questions. Um, with the cases we see on our um, list here that we had, like the schools having in the area, um, how are you coming up with those cases? Are they ones that were sick and came in, or are they ones like, okay, they're getting a surgery, maybe they're doing that, or is these just general testing? or? And like what type of testing are they doing for them? Okay, so let me, I'm gonna repeat the question, make sure I heard it, just again, just the distance here. Um, how are we coming up with the cases that are reported on the website and on the protecting our um, progress and then the school district level? Yes. Okay, they're all the same. Um, so for COVID, you are not a case unless you have, so a confirmed case is a case that has been, uh, that has received a lab test result. So it's not somebody who's come in sick, it is somebody who has been confirmed through a licensed lab as being positive for coronavirus. That's a confirmed case. A probable case, is an individual who is clinically consistent with COVID, 
but has not been confirmed with a lab test result. So in, uh, let me pull up, let me pull up our data here real quick. Bear with me. Do these tests tell if they have it at the moment or they had it at one time? They have it now. Okay. Yes. So the, uh, the PCR is a diagnostic, so it diagnoses now, and that's the nasal swabs that you're most familiar with. The antibody gives you a look back of have they had it, could they be coming to it based on how the antibodies are building in their body, um, whether it's the IgG or the IgM. Uh, so bear with me. I'm going to bring up our uh, report here. Okay, so when on the protecting our progress, monitoring and protecting our progress report, the incident rate includes both confirmed and probable cases. Positivity only looks at confirmed. cases. Okay, and that's in the narrative in that report, just as a reminder to uh, the readers of that report. Did that answer your question? Yes, and do you happen to know of the ones that are tested positive, how many of them been hospitalized? Uh, we, uh, we do. So hospitalization data, we don't, so Sometime in this pandemic, hospitals started reporting to uh, the state directly, much like other organizations. So I don't have it necessarily at an individual level until that comes all the way back down to the county level. So in our data set, we can tell if someone was hospitalized, but the more reliable data is at, uh, from the hospitals themselves to the state. Okay, so just for me, I'm bringing it up is they keep recording blanks for county. Right now, it has the lowest hospitalization rate they've had since the beginning. So I was wondering if that's a trend you're seeing. Maybe cases are coming, but hospitalization is dropping. So hospitalizations are down for COVID, and it and it really it makes sense because um, you know when. When COVID was predominantly within our uh, long-term care facilities. These are folks that are already at an older stage in their life. Many have existing uh, health conditions. Many have chronic conditions that get, you know, are just all exasperated with something like COVID. So that drove up the hospitalization rates. As we saw COVID move into the younger population who is typically healthier, our hospitalization rates naturally were going to go down. And really what you're seeing when somebody goes to the hospital now, they're, they're, they're really bad. They're not going because they feel yucky and they think they have COVID. They're going because their symptoms have transpired in a very quick order to drive them into that uh, you know, emergency room. So it's the nature of how this is cycling through the different populations. And it makes sense. You know, you're in a um, long-term care facility, there's physical walls and the, the people live there day in and day out. And the only variable is the staff coming and going. It looks very different than a school because your entire building empties every day and then it all comes back again. Um, so we're going to see it play out differently which is partly why we consider hospitalizations, but we don't put a big driver on hospitalizations. Um, or it's not the primary driver because that is telling us the sickest of the sick who are going there because we're not telling people go to the hospital if you think you have COVID. Jerry, for the record, Chester County hospitalizations have gone from 10 to 17 in the last two days. So not our area. That's just the county number. Right. Well, then it's no hospital, not their food. Okay. How about that? I have a, a comment and a question. Uh, the comment uh, 
There was a question sent in from Ms. Weinstein that had not been answered yet. That's my comment and the question from Ms. Kratzman. What do you say to parents uh, in our district that may uh, be weary of anything the health department has to say based for the recommendations based on the article that came out from the inquirer and followed up by the daily local and the antibody testing and the lack of transparency by the health department getting that information out? Uh, yeah, I, I'd be happy to address that. So um, not everything reported is factual. I'm going to start with that. Uh, the, the entire antibody program was not faulty. We had a few lot numbers that were faulty. Where we made the, uh, where we aired is we were trying to understand what was causing it. So when we communicated to those who were impacted by it uh, to say, your result may be invalid, we didn't want to have to say that and not have a why to include with it. Yes, we took too long to get to that. And that's where the error was. It wasn't a lack of transparency. It was trying, we were literally still in the process of working with our lab and our, uh, the vendor who made the test kits to understand what went wrong. When that story came out. And again, trying to be complete in our answer was what, where we aired. And we probably should have said one message then followed up with another. So um, I understand where there may be a lack of trust. I know a lot of our public thinks that all of those numbers, those invalid uh, results are in our positive counts. They are not. Antibody testing numbers have never been and will never be included in our positives because that is not a diagnostic test. These tests were put in place as one tool in a very early stage of our response when there wasn't ample diagnostic tests. And we made sure we were focusing on our essential workers within our county so they could make decisions on how to staff. So there were very specific things we were using that data for with our essential workers. It was not about quarantining or isolation or diagnosis or counts of positives at all. Um, so I understand where there may be some lack of trust, but again, it's not all facts that are put into that story and the follow-up story. Um, and we are we are here with our, you know, it is it is a point in time in this entire, what are we, eight months in response or nearly eight months response. Uh, and we're bound to have hiccups. There, it was not a lack of transparency. It was a hiccup, which, uh, you know, those of you in the medical field know that there's lot numbers that have problems in lots of different tests. Uh, we caught it and just took, took too long with our due diligence. And for that, I apologize for, um, and we have shored up our processes for any type of tests we're doing, uh, should we see anything that does not look as we expect it to look. So it's a risk we took as early adopters of a, uh, of a strategy, um, but I stand by that strategy because it was helpful um, for those who um, you know, we were partnering with to have used that tool. It was not for general public use, for sure. So, Did that help? Gee, yes. um, okay. one of the questions I get quite often is, you know, our kids have been away from us for six or more months and they often play outside and they're not wearing masks and they don't social distance at six feet. And, and so one of the challenges I get from um, our parents quite a bit is why can my child play outside with his friends, not have to wear a mask, not have to social distance at six feet, but when they come to you at school, you're going to require them to social distance at six feet and you're going to require them to wear a mask. Um, it's believe it or not, it's, it's a question I get quite a bit. I would first say 
that they should be wearing a mask and social distancing when they're playing with their friends, not household members, but friends. Um, I, I know my kids do. Uh, so that, it, it, that guidance is for all of us in all aspects of our life, both personal and professional, academic, sporting, it doesn't matter. That is the fat, the mask, I'm sorry, the face covering order. Uh, we do know, we, we absolutely know with coronavirus, mass and physical distance make a difference. So if they're not doing it at home, I would say they should be. And in addition, when you are magnifying the volume of students in a physical building, with lots of opportunities for interaction and lots of opportunity to be around kids that they don't play with on a regular basis. That's where the increase in uh, the requirement or the diligence around the masking and the social distancing and the hand sanitizing, et cetera, become important. Because we're not five kids in a backyard or five kids in the family room we're 500 plus in a building that has a lot of things going on in it. Uh, just one more question. I, question, probably the most common question I get is, when are we done? What do we have to do? Because <laughs> yes. it seems like every time you get an answer, there is no answer and it's just like, sorry, it's just, this is the new normal and you're going to have to put with it forever. So what do we have to do? I mean, what do you look at? I mean, from what I, you know, I hear it's always going to be here, so it's never going to go away. And so zero cases is impossible. So what is, what do we look for to get back to normal? So what we typically look for in public health with any type of disease, and, and we did this with flu, it's just a long time ago. Uh, we want to look for where the, you know, we're pretty stable on some significant uh, measures like our incidence and our positivity. Uh, and, you know, down in down, very low numbers over time. That, and we have a, a real proven prevention measure such as a vaccine that is truly putting it into more of a, yes, we know this is not gonna go away, but no, it doesn't live as a pandemic of this size going forward, but it becomes something that we can quickly identify, quickly put up measures to keep it at a reasonable level, much like we can do with flu when people get vaccinated and they pay attention to their sneezing and their hand washing, et cetera, during the flu season. So our goal right now is not even to get to zero because we can't get to zero without a, without a vaccine of some sort. Our goal is to get stable, low enough stable numbers so we can start to lift some of the restrictions to see then how this disease uh, responds while also implementing a, a vaccination approach. So we'll live with this. We will, but our goal is to get it under control so we're not wearing masks every day. We can get back to hugs. We don't have to, uh, you know, clean our surfaces so frequently and, hand, uh, you know, hand sanitize as we walk into every single, you know, doorway. So that's that's the that's the that's the ultimate uh, perspective of a of a public health approach. For it. I guess the reason I said this, I'm just I feel like we the longer this goes on, the further behind our students are getting, and we're going to have a whole lost age group here with schooling, with uh, mental health, with so when does the determination? what's more important come into play, mental health and education of the kids, or, you know, you know, how are you gonna figure that part out? Yeah, it's what's like that risk tolerance. Mm -hmm. I think that's why, I mean, that, that's why we wanna come back on October 12th, and get that hybrid model that we'll have. But there's still, my problem is it's still three days 
are still not getting the education they would five days a week rate. And that's what we need to get back to, and that's what I want to know. What is the risk level? What's more important? You know, kids not getting the education or, you know, that's why I just, I just don't see it with the numbers and the risk and everything else, how losing to that for our discussion. I, I do think, it, you know, and I, I said this in a short speech to the uh, teachers when we had that kickoff day, that my expectation is it's going to be this entire school year we will be pivoting um, between what we're in right now, which is remote, and then given community transmission levels in, this, in the metrics that Gigi Patton has been talking about, where we can go to hybrid. Um, and if we get down to even lower, where we can go in person. But given that this is a virus that we don't have immunity to, we're going to have to be wearing masks. We're going to have to maintain even a six foot distance unless um, there is a change in the recommendation. But it's that, that the virus isn't changing. But I, I think it will be this week. I just think it's ridiculous. I mean, that's just how I feel and been how I personally been feeling about it. I just think the risk to what we see with hospitalization and everything else, it's just we are destroying our kids and it, I um, it's just I mean, saying anymore. I just think the mental health and the issues going on with our children, not be able to be socializing anymore or in classrooms where we got kids who can't learn this way and we are losing. And we can't keep losing our kids. And I think everybody's forgetting about that. And I keep hearing everybody saying we're being selfish for not wearing a mask, but sometimes I think we're being selfish for putting all this stuff over on our kids. And that's where I'm getting. A couple things. First off, what, to everybody at home, what Brian Fox, the president, just said is never been discussed at the board level. It's not the board's position. That's his own personal opinion. The second thing, can we not not discuss now while we have the board of health person here? Let her finish, and then we can discuss. But let's get back on track. Other questions? Okay, Charlie. Hi, Jenny. This is Charlie Conacher. Um, I was just wondering, what was the change in data that that promoted um, the change from from the health department to remove the recommendation to propose postpone athletic competitions until January 2021? So that's a great question. The change was the misinterpretation of the original guidance. So the original guidance was echoing what Governor Wolf's recommendation was. Unfortunately, our guidance was interpreted as a requirement versus a recommendation because we fully understood that sports is different because we have the PIAA, PIAA involved in it. Uh, and we were not trying to make separate, you know, unique Chester County Health Department guidance. So unfortunately it got misconstrued, interpreted and leveraged that way. So we then said, listen, we, we are in support of, you know, the governor's recommendation. We fully respect the PIAAs. Uh, you know, the information they've put out, they got down to some detail that we were looking for from a, you know, a sporting standpoint. Uh, so it wasn't really, it wasn't a data. It was, we had so many questions from schools, boards, uh, superintendents, and the public that it was assumed that we shut it all down when in fact, we were only trying to echo what was already being communicated by the others. Um, so that's where that got changed. Uh, and that's why we, you know, modified how it was stated in the document. So, so the change was caused not by a data change. 
Or Correct. It was right because of peer pressure or pressure. No, not no, not peer pressure. Misinterpretation, misrepresentation, misunderstanding. Not peer pressure. Not not from my standpoint. And that misrepresentation was by who? Uh, public and school boards and you, you name it. Because all of the questions were, why are you shutting down sports? I'm not shutting down sports. And sports didn't have a timeline in ours. We had no timeline uh, except for the January. Uh, well, we have the, we have the January, I, I will say that. We have the January 2021 to revisit uh, competition. But conditioning, practicing, training, that was, that's in the guidance as was going forward. Um, I have one. Um, when will the Lancaster uh, County Municipal data be in our numbers? Or are you going to be able to add that? So I checked in on that again today. Um, the only municipal level data I have been able to get my hands on are deaths, and that's you know, that's a part of the equation, but not all of it. Uh, so I'm going to continue to see how I can get that data or even extrapolate it. Um, we did, you know, I have a few uh, staff that let me know that they may have some contacts that they can call, but uh, uncertain with a definitive timeline. Okay, then are we, are we okay that just applying the uh, data that we have from your report on Fridays to make our uh, opening decisions? I, I think you are fine. You have two municipalities outside of Chester County. I would be more concerned if it was more, but the majority of your municipalities are within Chester County. Okay, that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thanks again for coming. You are welcome. Uh, and if you have any further questions, uh, Michelle knows how to get a hold of me. I'd be happy to, uh, you know, continue to uh, respond. And certainly, um, it, regardless of what decision you make, and I understand the magnitude of the decisions you are making and the measures you're putting in place, Chester County Health Department is here to stand next to you throughout this. We are not going away. Um, and we are committed to partnering to get our goal is the same as yours, get kids back in the classroom safely. So, Dee, before you go, just so I can, cl I can clarify, um, administration's recommendation to the board is that we move ahead with bringing our kids back. And so based on the data that we see and the reports that I see, um, I believe this team can do that and still protect the health and the welfare of our kids. So now we know K-6 isn't going to necessarily look the same as 7 to 12 because of the challenges that we have 7 to 12. And I think you jumped in on that, you know, as we were talking about that group A, group B approach. But um, based on the data and the information that we see and, and the conversations that I've had with you and the other superintendents once or twice a week, I mean, we feel as an administration, we're on the right path. We're on the right path and it's time to bring our kids back. Um, is there anything that you're seeing in any of the data or the information that would give me pause in addition to the level of questions that we asked you tonight in regards to the, the procedures that we want to put in place to protect the health and safety and welfare of our students and staff? Yeah, another great question. Uh, not in terms of procedures. So, you know, for me, when I think about coronavirus, there has been some pretty consistent things. Uh, and that has allowed us to anchor on these tenets of masking and physical separation and good hand hygiene and watching your symptoms. So that, those messages have not changed, which is a good thing because we, you know, but by the same token, and this is the piece I caution everybody on, because we're seeing it in other parts of the country, is fatigue is real. Fatigue with this virus is real. It's real in our youth, it's real in our professionals, it's real in our stay at home 
uh, parents, it's real in, you know, our leaders, it doesn't matter who you are, we're all fatigued by this. So the most important thing as you, as you come into, you know, more in-person school, as we fill our athletic stadiums, as we get back out and, you know, engage in our community businesses more regularly and more, you know, freely, we, we cannot let our guard down. We cannot. I know people are really tired of hearing about it, but we can't. And we're, we're approaching a seasonal change and we're approaching flu season. And we don't know how these three are going to interact. We hope masking and good sanit hand sanitation uh, and good um, you know, practices around keeping healthy are going to help us in the flu. Uh, but we just don't know. So I know, I know the fatigue. I am fatigued with it. Uh, you'd be amazed how many times I rush out of the house and forget my mask. And I'm like, ah, got to go back and get my mask. Um, but we have to just acknowledge it. Yes, it's difficult. Yes, it's annoying. Yes, it's, you know, still going on. But if we let down while our kids are coming in and our athletes are, you know, performing before spectators, I don't want it to fall apart at that point. The goal is to get them in and stay in as long as possible. Um, so that would be my only thing. You're, you know your procedures, you know the processes, you know the measures. It's more of the encouragement and the support to keep it up with, in good faith, with diligence and in earnest. That's really what I think is gonna be our next challenge. I mean, we're already into that challenge, but challenge as we come back into school and other things that are in the, on the bigger side. Thank you, Jean. You are very welcome. All right, I am gonna say good evening to everybody. Pleasure uh, talking with you. Thank you for really, really thoughtful questions uh, and stay healthy. Thanks again. You're welcome. So we're on track for October 12th. We are on track for October 12th. Mike, I did have one question. In your presentation, you said transition October 12th. Mm -hmm. Is that effective that Monday to follow the schedule that you laid out with the bread and blue team? You might want to grab a mic when it's day after that. And then we can also talk about what the K to 6 transition plan is that week. We Monday, October 12th. Yeah, we would. Yeah, we would start the transition to get back. We need to bring back we feel the seventh and ninth grade the first in the building because if you're going to bring them in, they have never been seventh grade, never been in the junior senior high school, and like the ninth grade, never been in the senior high. You bring them back with the tenth, eleventh, twelfth graders. I think it's going to be very overwhelming for them without some type of transition day or orientation day um, here by themselves in smaller groups. That was what we meant by transitioning back. For the first two. The first two. Okay. Okay. I just want to thank. But, but how long? So how long? So when would you expect seven to twelve for the whole program to start? Well, that's what we're discussing. Whether or not Wednesday coming back, bringing everybody back, ten, eleven, everybody in the building, uh -huh. um, is feasible, or do we need more transition time to slowly transition back? I know some schools are doing, you know. They're bringing back groups at a time, weeks, and then, you know, they're transitioning out into a month and not just a week. So we want to do what's best to get our kids back here as smoothly as possible. So it's just the next step that we try to plan. Okay, so it's not necessarily going to be months. It would be, no, 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 no. Okay, no, 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 no. Yeah, we clarify that, right? Yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, on the K-6 side of the house, so Chris will leave, so just to give you an example, so the, the kindergarten students will come back uh on the 12th okay and then on the 13th it would be the kindergarten students and first grade and then the 14th then it would be the kindergarten students first grade and grade two okay um the elementary school and the intermediate school would follow the same path right so with the elementary school third grade would come back on the 12th and then on the 13th it would be grades three and four right so you see so, so by, by midweek, all of K-6 is back, right? 
Um, but we really feel it's important, especially up here in the junior, senior high, and, and also think about too, our students have been away from the business and the structure of school for seven months. Seven months. So we know that there's going to be a lot of um, attention that needs to be paid to the culture of the school, the climate of the school, the procedures that we need to put in place to not only support our students, but our staff. Um, you know, there's a, there's a good bit of work that needs to occur there in a short amount of time. Um, but bringing kids back cold, as I've said in the last few weeks, not an option for us. That, that is a non-negotiable, non you don't bring kids in to any type of school in environment and give them a cold start when they've been away from you for so long. Right? We believe that positive tra transition, that tier, is going to pay off for us this year. Can I ask a question? Um, going back, to, we're just starting to get into this a little bit, and then Jeannie popped on and showed up. This is for whoever can answer. But the, um, the grab and go lunch, I'll make sure I understand what I heard. That they're going, it's going to be in their classroom. They're only allowed to have their mask off for 10 minutes. Is that, I understand that right? That might be a few things. Are they allowed to have the mask off the entire time while they eat their lunch? That's no worries that the kids six eat lunch in the classroom. Our kids won't eat lunch in the classroom. Great. Are you talking about K to six? Uh, where, 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 I think it was K to six. Part yeah. of discussion. Is that they only get 10 minutes to have their no, mask? No, they wouldn't break? get 10, 10 minutes. So, we're, we're so that's not their mask break. break. Right. That's not their mask break. That's lunch. And I know Krista and Brian and Kristen are looking at all kinds of scenarios where they're also going to be able to use their cafeterias as well and be able to spread those kids out. Um, you know, so they keep, no, no. So Brian is not, because your cafeteria becomes a classroom, correct? Um, but yeah, we, we would not ask a uh, child to run through okay. lunch. Okay. And so then like, where, 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 do you, where are you guys having your lunches then? We don't, we're not having lunch. You know, okay. There is the a 10 minute, you do have a 10 minute, minute, 10 minute snack. snack. Is that being provided by the district? Yes. Yes. Okay. It seems to me we're under some obligation Provide something, so I'm glad to hear this. Yes. Yeah. You know, it's still providing this junior senior people kids down lunch, but they're picking that up. On Fridays. So Fridays. Yeah. So yeah. that, that was my second question. I'm glad you did a great, great segue. So, can someone please, if they know, give me some substantive, uh, I have an idea of what the substance of these lunches are that they're packing on Friday. That are of value in the entire week. I'm certain there's nothing in there that's perishable. This is all prepackaged, some sort of like astronaut food, I'm guessing. <laughs> that's correct. So, um, Lisa, can you sit down front and use the mic? Because yeah. I know we have a lot of people in the Zoom room and they're, they're going to want to hear this. So, so Lisa Mack will be out for the junior, senior high school team. She took the lead on this and has been working with Lynn's and that's our food service director um, on making sure our kids are taken care of. So Brian, um, from what Linda was saying, it's the same type of food that they're be, they are getting now. So um, a lot of it is it's not, you know, refrigerated type of perishable type of thing. It's something that you know they can last. They do provide milk, so you know some of the things will need to be put in the refrigerator. Some of them are packaged type of things. It's, um, this is the way that they have to get that food out to them now. But you know, she was saying something like a taco, a packaged taco, or and things like that. So, but they have to provide it five days. So they they will provide breakfast one day out of the week. That Friday breakfast. Any other questions? Not a question specific for Lisa or, or food distribution in general, but and, and I don't, I certainly don't want this to come across as questioning any plan that anyone has done. I am probably the furthest uh, from an education expert in the room that there is. But I don't know how, as a board, we can vote on these plans when there's still so many questions. I mean, I went to kids in school two weeks ago. I'm like, you know, that's what we need to do, but I, I'm, I'm good with targeting that date, but there just seems to be so many questions and so many what ifs. I don't know how we say yes to a plan 
that we saw for five minutes up on the screen without studying it and maybe poking holes in it and seeing it from different perspectives. I just, I'm, I'm on Jerry's side. I want the kids in school, but I don't know how we say yes to a plan that's still a lot of holes in it. Is it the K-6 plan or the 7 to 12 plan? Yes, both. <laughs> I, I mean, again, I don't mean to criticize anybody, but we just saw this block schedule blue, red on the screen for eight minutes, maybe. I don't know how I can say yes to that. And I don't want to sound difficult, but uh, it's hard for me to go to a bunch of parents and explain them anything yet until we have time to study. That's just my comment. That's not, that's my personal opinion. Nothing for the board. Well, maybe it'd be helpful if they could give us uh, you know, the, the, the uh, chart that was shown with the, some descriptions and a, and a greater uh, you know, detail than what was provided that they could be sent to us. Is that a possibility, guys? Sure. You know, we can look at oh, yeah. We have questions, we can ask them. Yeah. And I think that the K through six, I think it could be pretty, it, it, at least I, my opinion, we've articulated it consistently the whole time. Like, I, I'm not sure there's any information. Um, and if Christian wants to say something that the high school one, the, the seven through 12 is, is again, hearing it new. And I, and I agree with you, I don't have any, I trust they've been working on it. And a lot of, but there are questions that I'm trying to anticipate what I would ask. Um, K through six, I don't, I don't know. I think it's some yeah. way. I think time is not on our side either. We can't wait for the next meeting. Well, one thing I, I think we can't lose sight of is, you know, they dropped beans. That initially, our plan was to bring them back, and then they went from three foot to six foot. So they probably had a fair amount of this. Some of this groundwork was done, you know, on some level. Uh, I have less problem with the K six plan than I do the seven. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry, and, and I feel the way you do, Mr. Uh, Hurley. I, I would have liked to have the students back weeks ago. Um, here's my concern with what you're discussing right now. If what we share with you, the questions you come up with, has any impact on the plans that we've developed, that information needs to go home to parents tomorrow or the next day, like it, because they, they need to get that information to plan for the following week. So that, that's where I get concerned. I, I'm, I'm very worried about the timeline and how we get that information out to everybody. And, and but I agree, I know the predicament that you are in as well, uh, but please know that, that I feel I feel like parents should have had information a little while ago. So um, I'm eager to get it out to them so that they know exactly what their kids are going to experience when they come to school on the 12th. Along those lines, can we also look at this and say um, the plans that you've made that you put a lot of time into, at the end of the day, are still they're still movable. Like 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 I'm understanding that let's say you know, you, you go into month and month into this, there's going to be you're going to be changing things or, or adapting or tweaking things as well. So the framework would be a hybrid, but within that framework, maybe I'm going to make a, a uh, you know, positive, you know, thought that you're going to change things if needed. Right. Yeah, we need to, we need a place to start from. And that's, and I, I understand what you're saying. I don't know what to do. I don't know yeah, how to do Like I said, I don't want death to come across in, in any way a criticism or a critique of anything the administration, anyone's done. They've done a monumental Herculean, whatever effort you want to call it. I just think there's a lot of parents. I mean, I read these all all meeting long. There's a million questions flying in, sure. and that's good. I, I just think it, it's hard to say yes to something when there's so many questions. Well, and we have a communication plan that is set to go tomorrow. So, and in a way to address all the questions and concerns that folks will have. So, you know, we have prepared for that. Yeah, there are there are other districts. We I think we talked about it last week. But there are other districts that are doing uh, uh, like Zoom meetings where the superintendent the principal will present. Here's here's what it's going to look like. Here's what it's going to be. I don't think in this meeting my expectation anyway wasn't. Uh, um, and this is just my I'm chastised really, so this is just my expectation. But uh, my expectation was that we wouldn't see all of that detail. Right? We're we're 
we're improving an approach for hybrid, hybrid and insemination. Every school has different ways that they're cutting and slicing it in order to be able to fit the students that they've got into the buildings and facilities that they have. Um, but I appreciate that you want more information. Um, so I, I don't know if if we as a group are willing to have the administration continue with the plan as is, targeting October 12th return, being able to communicate those details to us and to the parents and community. I think we would have the ability at any point to raise a red flag. Um, but to, to Dr. Warner's point about um, um, having a place to start, like let's, let's have a. But, so. Yeah, I'm fine with that. I think um, I think the adjustment to the longer classes in, 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 the, in the secondary could be problematic. Um, you know, there's going to be some um, PD. Additional requirements, which which might be addressed, um, you know, and some of us just want to be like, you know, like just do it, you know. You don't have to take the training wheels <laughs> off and do it. And I just, I, we're up against the timeline. We all want our kids in as much as we can, and let's let it fly. That's uh, just, I think we have to do that. As long as all the precautions that and the mitigation standards that we've all come accustomed to are maintained, and and, and we see where the parts fall. And, you know, our staff is, is, is very good, professional, but they don't fly. But having said that, I would like to see a little more breakdown in the block scheduling, the, uh, the uh, how, how that works uh, from a, you know how like, you know, we always worry about the short classes that we have and not becoming the same things day, right? Is that the, the line of the day? So now all of a sudden we're increasing that and with how we'd like to, how, how that learning tool is going to be changed. I'd like to see some guidance. Some guidance. We'll put some things together for you this week. And I guess if I need to know more, like what, what the expectations are of our professional staff. Mm -hmm. like what's their day going to look like? Right. Having a class now that's an hour and a half long or whatever. Right. We continue to build airplanes in the air. We're getting very good at that. Uh, I just want to check this. Does the board feel like it needs a meeting on the 5th to confirm where we're at, or, or we get we put the information out to you and away we go? I'm good. Um, okay. I just feel like, again, I know you guys are working on that, but trust this point that, that you're using all the data that we can use. I'm concerned about parents. I'm concerned yes. that we get information out. That's yep. my challenge right now, and I yep. don't know anything to be posed on that. But again, with the, with the full realization that a lot of us will hear things, and I think we need to communicate some of that. Send, send them you know, again, I've, you know, I've already heard you a little bit about this, like that, and, and I we need to listen to be done to the, the feedback that we get from the folks, not just our staff, right? That feedback, which is incredibly important, but also the, yeah. the end users, right? The students, the families, and they're going into the wall, right? We you know, we need to anticipate and, and encourage them to communicate that, right? Um, and just to give our school community a snapshot, so um, who's at tomorrow? Me, Mr. Hillbold, Mr. Curtis. We have a meeting with Old House in here so we can finalize the transportation and we can get bus routes out to parents by the end of the week. Okay. Um, um, Elena Sahal and I met with Mike Brooks and the junior senior high school team today. Um, and, and we know that, that there's a whole host of parent uh, communication and things that need to occur. Um, we meet with the elementary team tomorrow at eight or nine o'clock. I don't know. There's meeting after meeting after meeting right now. As and so we say that in the assurance that that we do have our eye on October 12th. We know there are. It's a very um, intensive timeline, right? Um, that we need to work through. Um, and to our school community, you can expect a letter from me at some point tomorrow before noon. Um, the draft is done. It's just a matter of, of uh, having the opportunity to vet it with the team one last time to make sure it captures the conversation that we've had here tonight. And I think our parents are going to find in the next two weeks they're going to be tired of hearing from all of us. But every day it's going to be something new. Um, because as I've said to the team 
numerous times in the last week or so, I feel like we are reopening school again, right? So all that work that we do in the summer months to prepare for a new school year right now, we're doing in a period of two and a half to three weeks. One of the things I want to verify now, while I found it distracting that the chat stuff was popping up like subtitles on the screen, there were some very good questions on there. Someone does take a chance to review them and mm -hmm. push out the answers or the questions so that people can answer that to whoever answers yep. in some form. It's, yep, because that, that, those kinds of questions make for a great FAQ sheet, okay? Um, uh, so I know the hour is late. We have one more thing on the agenda. Um, our athletic director is here. Our high school principal is here. They want to give you an athletic update. And administration has a recommendation for the board. Hi, Ms. Gato. Did we win? We did. Outstanding. Good evening, everyone. Uh, this past weekend, we had a lot of athletic events that happened on campus Friday night. We had our football team. Uh, we issued about 72 tickets, and all, only 48 uh, family members came out. Then on Saturday, it was a full day of athletics. We had boys and girls varsity teams in the stadium. We issued tickets to those families, and about 30, 35 attendees came out to those competitions. Um, everyone is doing a good job of social distancing and wearing their masks. We had very few issues, and the issues we had actually was came from the visitors' teams coming, their parents coming to try to watch. So right now we have told them multiple times that we are not allowing any um, visiting spectators. Going forward, I would like to see if we could push that number right now. We're at option seven, allowing two tickets uh, for our families, seeing if we can increase that number to four tickets and allowing the siblings to also attend. I've heard from a lot of parents lately is that it is very difficult for them to come out and watch their son or daughter play when they have a little child at home. They're in the same household. So I don't know um, what the issue would be if those siblings would come out, sit with their parents, and be able to watch their older sister or brother play in a competition. I know that 250 and 25 is now off the table from the government. Um, so I do have the numbers here if we want to increase the capacity. The issue I have with increasing the capacity is that we're going to bring a lot more in that could cause some more issues. Uh, we agree not to have a student section, but, are, but increasing it to four tickets will allow those family members to be able to come and watch and also to bring in their siblings. Other school districts are doing a little bit differently. They, because our venue is much larger than ours, they are able to have spectators, visiting spectators, to come and watch. Uh, because of our stadium only having one side of bleachers, it is going to be very hard for my staff and I to be able to social distance and keep everyone safe. So that is why I'm recommending not having uh, visiting team spectators at any of the events. Um, if we are, had a different setup and we had bleachers on the opposite side, then it will be a little bit different and we'll be able to do that safely. I don't think uh, we would be able to do that by keeping the six feet um, possible if we allow visiting spectators to come in. So we are a little bit different than other districts. Um, some districts are allowing, like I said, visitors, but I feel that we should not. So I just need to know if it was okay to increase that number to allow our, the siblings to attend, um, also to allow possibly increasing the number of four tickets for our event. Our field hockey and our junior high sports have been well attended uh, to the point where, you know, there's social distancing, masks, and sitting so far apart, we don't really have to say anything to them. Yeah, do you worry about, um, I'm more concerned, quite frankly, with the indoor at this point. So what's the comfort level you have with, uh, say, watching a volleyball game? I think with the volleyball match, we can definitely uh, safely do social distance with just our four tickets for our family, uh, for a uh, player on the roster. I truly believe we can pull out both sides of the bleachers. We'll still be able to have the players sit six feet apart with the chairs that we already use, 
uh, for a normal match. But now that that 25 went away, I do not need to count the 25 that includes our team and the personnel that has to work the volleyball match. Volleyball match, you have a lot of people have to work it to make the match run smoothly. So I think with the numbers that I have, we can do that. They only have 30 on the roster. If we increase that to four tickets, it's only 120 in the stands. And that's if everyone comes. They may not all attend. So I think we can do that safely. I know they're eager as everyone else is to come in and watch, but I know the inside sports are a little bit more difficult. So I'm confident that we can get them in and out safely. We're able to open up all the doors so that way they can exit safely, the same as when they're entering in. Now, same as before, we will not be charging to get into athletic events. And that is the same across the Lancaster 11 and Lake. No one is charging, but just the difference of how many spectators are allowing in. So, Ms. Norris, to answer your question, I think <coughs> indoor with 120, I, I believe we can do that safe. Can you turn off the basketball? When does that start? <laughs> Okay, so I haven't. No, no, I haven't. We have not, as a Lancaster Levin League, have not started talking about uh, winter sports. Oh, okay. Um, that winter sports start, and I don't quote me on this date, but I believe it's November 20th. Please don't take that as my word. We've been so focused on fall sports. Great. A lot of us are starting to have those conversations, but we haven't taken that leap yet because we're still trying to get through fall sports. So I'll be able to answer that question for you uh, probably mid-October. Thanks. Yeah, the, the four tickets, does that include the kids that may come? That would include anyone in their family of the four, yes. Not not the player themselves. Right, right. Yes. so if someone has a family of say five, six, or seven. Uh, right, I mean, we can look at increasing the numbers to six, but that um, would only take us up to 180 in the stands. So we have the capacity to do outside sports up to six tickets. I would recommend not increasing the indoor volleyball to six tickets though. I think we keeping it at four tickets would help the best. Angie, what about um, um, not for the indoor sport but for outdoor sports? And I, I totally support the four tickets but if, you know, again, we, we have lists. We know the, the families, we know the players. To Tony's point, if you have a, a, a player that has six, you know, it's not every family has that. But if we right. had that, would we allow a little bit of, you know, so not everybody gets six, because my, my concern has always been, is, you know, one foot in the door, we've now allowed visitors, we've now allowed student sections. Like, again, I don't want to ruin our entire plan on going back because we're trying to fill a stadium. But I think reasonably, especially outdoors, if you have, you know, if you've got five siblings, can we do that on a one, you know, on an individual basis? Yes, yeah, so I can put a like I can ask the families. So I can start out with the four tickets, and if they need more tickets because of their family, our immediate family is much larger. I can definitely do that. I do not see that for being a problem. Right. And the intermediate. Again, we're not looking at people taking advantage of it and saying, okay, I'm going to have to go off, I'm going to have to go through, I'm going to have my cousins. You know, again, let's keep what our what is our focus. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that's unreasonable. Um, yeah, in in the letter that I have been putting out to the families, it, it clearly states what the requirements are. Um, if we allow the students to attend, I clearly state in there that they have to be with their parent. There is no more of them throwing the football around or kicking the soccer ball in the back corner of the of the field. It has to be done in the past. They must be seated with their parents at all times. So yes, we can definitely make that uh, recommendation to the parents if they need more tickets for their immediate family. That is not a problem. And, and I was encouraged by Social County Department of Health, you know, using more <laughs> physical stadiums, you know, saying let's. We can move forward, but we need to keep all the precautions right. and be really stringent on how we enforce them, which appears to be what you're, you're yes. doing. So I would say we're support moving forward with what we want to do. Yes, I'm not looking to fill the stadiums, but I am looking to help the family members that are coming in. Like even a father today, <coughs> and he had to find a babysitter for her, his younger daughter, and then his older daughter couldn't come. And it was just a very situation that we could have avoided going forward if we allow them to own more tickets. Absolutely, and that's, that's what we're trying to do. We don't want to solve them for our families in multiple ways to make it you know, acceptable within guidelines. 
And if you don't like your family, you can always sell your other tickets. <laughs> <laughs> One more question. Penn State Station. You mentioned there was uh, some away parents for Yes. Um, was it, was it uh, just like a verbal to get out of hand or was it just not understanding and not what not allowing you? They are, are um, they are understanding to a point, but then we call them trying to sneak in. Um, our, our staff that I have working with security always mixed with rounds around the track and around the uh, softball field. And even though I have told all the athletic directors, and I tell them daily that we are not allowing the visiting spectators, I don't, I don't know what happens after that I tell that athletic director. They always come and they say, well, we didn't know. Um, so we just encourage them to like stay in their vehicles um, so that way they're not out in the public. Um, it, last on Saturday we had a, a, a family from Keckway who was very angry, um, but you know they they used the excuse, well we gave you guys tickets, but we also told them this is our our grounds, our rules. I can't control what happens in your, your district, so here we're going to go with that. So just trying to get them to understand, even though they drive here doesn't mean they're going to be able to get in. And with the security stuff that I have on, they do a good job of making sure the uh, visitors are not around or they try to sneak in and make sure they leave. Angie, this is Charlie Conker. I'd like to commend you for your clarity and your communication with every athletic parent in the district. I've had multiple parents reach out to me and say how safe they felt at the games, socially distanced, wearing a mask, and how clear the communication was. Thank you very much for keeping that up. Thank you.